Hello, this is Pastor Gavin Whitcomb from Moore's Mountain Church near Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Are you ready to dig into the Word? So am I. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. We praise you for your mercy and your grace and your power. We pray that you guide us as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'd like to uh, um, share with you from Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, we're going through the book of Ephesians verse by verse. Uh, an expository uh, series. So Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 5 talk about how you and I who are saved uh, have been raised to life through God's mercy and love. So um, he says, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now we have to remember who he's writing this to. He's writing these, this to, according to chapter 1 verse 1, uh, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, you and I today might not live in Ephesus, but uh, you and I who are the saints of God, the people of God, the faithful, in other words, we have faith in Christ Jesus, you and I who have been saved by God's grace. This is true of us. So, um, Paul describes the working of God in our lives that brought us to the place where we were saved, by God's grace. So, you know, when we read this, we ought to respond with thanksgiving and praise to God at the thought of how God has worked in our lives. So with that in mind, let's look at this and really dig into it. He says, and you hath he quickened. Now, the word quickened means made alive. Now, uh, if you have a King James Version, as I do, you'll notice that hath he quickened are in italics. And uh, that is the you know, the translators of the King James were honest in, some, in saying, hey, this isn't in the original language, but we believe the original language implies this. So you hath he quickened, but you see, if you drop down to verse 5, it says, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. So that's why they put that in italics. That's what he's talking about. So uh, in my estimation, they were right. They were correct. You hath he quickened. And, and so what does it mean to be quickened? That's the old English way of saying made alive. So um, you see, the, the Bible tells us that before God quickened us, before he made us alive, we were dead. Now, he obviously doesn't mean physically dead, right? He's talking about a state of spiritual death. He says we were dead in trespasses and sins. Okay, now, uh, tr trespass has the idea of God draws a line and says, don't cross that line, and we disobey, and we cross it. Sins is a general overall term, meaning that we fall short of God's glory. We fail to do what we're supposed to do, or we do things we're not supposed to do, and we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, and we've all trespassed against God. So we were dead in trespasses and sins. So this refers to a state or a condition of spiritual death. Now, uh, at Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 states it this way, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, with Christ, having forgiven you all trespasses. Okay, so this takes place at once. God uh, gives us eternal life. He makes us alive. We, uh, we put our, our faith in Christ. God forgives our sins, and he grants us the gift of eternal life. So that happens when God saves us. Now, if we look at the idea of death in the scriptures, it carries with it the idea of being without life and the concept of separation. Okay, so... You know, for example, with spiritual death, I mean, I meant to say physical death, the spirit slash soul separates from the body and the body becomes lifeless, right? So in Genesis 35, uh, it describes Rachel giving birth to Benjamin. It says, it came to pass that when she was in hard labor, the midwife said to her, fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing 
for she died. Okay, so her soul was leaving uh, because she died. So sometimes the Bible uses, well, more often than not, the term soul and spirit are used interchangeably in the scriptures. Now, sometimes there is a distinction, but more often than not, they're used interchangeably. If you go to James 2.26, it says the body without the spirit is dead. Okay, so, so that's physical death, right? That's separation and uh, lifelessness as a result of it. Now, the Bible also talks about the second death. Now, what's the second death? Well, when the unsaved and unredeemed sinners remain in a state of spiritual death and they die physically, and they stand before God at the great white throne judgment, they will be sentenced eternally to the lake of fire to be forever separated from God relationally, separated from his mercy and his grace and his love, and eternally excluded from his kingdom and under his wrath. Okay, so Revelation chapter 20 talks about that. Revelation 20 verses 14 and 15, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now what's it mean, death and hell cast into the lake of fire? Death is a reference to the grave and therefore the body. And hell is a reference to people who were in hell, temporarily confined there until the final great white throne judgment. So they are cast both body and soul into the lake of fire. The Bible says that is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, Re Revelation 2.11 says, uh, He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And First John tells us, Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Revelation 26 says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. Okay, so you and I are saved. The second death has no power over us. Revelation 21, 8, but the fearful, that's those who are too afraid to, to become a Christian and trust in Christ as our Lord and Savior because they're afraid of what other people will say. The fearful are cowardly in that sense and unbelieving and abominable, uh, those who are very wicked and evil and murderers, we know what that is, and whoremongers, those who are sexually immoral as a lifestyle, and sorcerers, those who are involved in witchcraft and sorcery and that type of thing, and idolaters, those who worship idols and all liars, uh, as a continual habitual unrepentant way of life, what it means here. Uh, he says they shall have their part in the lake, which burneth with fire and brimstone, brimstone is sulfur, which is the second death. Okay, so we have physical death, uh, a lifeless body, and the soul or spirit separates from the body. We have the second death in which sinners are forever separated from God and his mercy and grace and excluded permanently from his kingdom. So there's a separation there. But uh, here he says, You hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. This speaks about uh, a state of spiritual death. In other words, to be dead in our trespasses and sins means that we do not have the eternal life of God within us. And because of that, we lack the desire or the ability to be rightly related to God. We can't, we can't love, we can't really love God. We can't rightly be related to him. And we can't truly please him. That's what it means to be uh, in a state of spiritual death. Let me read to you here <clears throat> in Romans chapter 8. He says, they that are after the flesh, and if you read the chapter, after the flesh means you're not saved. They that are after the flesh do mind, mind means to pursue or to desire and follow after. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the saved, they mind or pursue the things of the Spirit. So you know, I, you and I who are saved, why do we pursue the things of the Spirit? Why, why are we interested in the things of God? 
Why are we interested in the word of God and the truth of God and want to be around the people of God? Why do the things of the kingdom of heaven interest us and we want to be rightly related to God and want to live his way? Well, because we, why do we mind the things of the spirit? Well, because we're after the spirit. He says to be carnally minded is death. In other words, to follow the carnal mind, the unsaved mind in that way of life uh, and pursue those things, it results in death. Not only physical, but eternal and spiritual death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You and I who are saved and are therefore because of God working in us, spiritually minded, it results in life, real life here and eternal life and peace, right? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Enmity means it, it's in an adversarial relationship against God, the carnal mind. Yeah, and carnal here means fleshly, an unsaved person. If you read the whole chapter, you, you can see that. He says, the carnal mind, it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Okay, so those who are in the flesh, they can't please God. And the next verse says, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Okay, so believers are not in the flesh. We are in the Spirit. Okay, so those who are in the flesh can't please God. If someone isn't saved, forget about trying to earn eternal life. It You can't do it. You could never please God. So we have to come to God and ask for mercy on the basis of Christ's death and his resurrection. Okay, so now he says... Uh, uh, this this separation from God in a relational sense means that we're far from God and we're alienated from God. Uh, okay, now let me just read you a couple passages here. Chapter 2 and verse 13 of Ephesians. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes, sometimes means at one time, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Okay, so we were far away, now we're brought near to God through the blood of Christ. Now let me read to you Ephesians chapter 4 and um, verse 18. He says, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. In other words, they had no part in the eternal life of God, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Okay, now a few other passages of scripture that he least to date this same truth, Colossians 121, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Okay, so being in a state of spiritual death, you can't please God and you can't really rightly relate to God. It's like just like a body that's dead can't do anything. Well, that's how we are in terms of our spirit rightly relating to God. Uh, you know, in Genesis 2.17, God told Adam and Eve that if they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God said, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Now, I, I suppose that could mean that, okay, in the day you eat thereof, in that very day, something's going to change. From that very day, you're going to be under a death sentence, and you're going to die, eventually. Okay, that's one way to take that. But I, I think what God was saying there was that in the day that you eat thereof, the very day you eat, you're going to die a spiritual death, where you'll be alienated from me, separated from me, in a relational sense to where you can't please me and uh, you can't rightly relate to me anymore. So I think that's what God meant. Uh, Adam and Eve certainly didn't drop over physically dead that very day. So now this verse here is saying that when the Lord saves us and probably most, if not all who are listening to me today, you're probably saved. And that's why you're interested in what God's word has to say. When the Lord saves us, he raises us from a state of spiritual death to a state of spiritual life 
by placing his eternal life within us so that we are a new creation. Uh, so he makes us new within. He renews us within. Uh, and, and so now uh, when, when he renews us, raising us from spiritual death to spiritual life, now we're capable of pleasing God. And now he makes us capable of having a meaningful and harmonious relationship with him. So God imparting his eternal life to us is in the Bible called regeneration. Regeneration. Okay, in other words, giving us new life, making us alive again. We were dead. He makes us alive again. And so regeneration. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Titus 3, 5 says this that it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration. In other words, God regenerates us, and that's when he washes us. That's when he cleanses us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So see, the Holy Spirit has a role in regenerating us and renewing us, making us a new creature in Christ. Now another term that the scriptures use to describe regeneration is to be born again. Can you remember in John 3 Jesus conversation with Nicodemus? Uh, remember Jesus told him except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of God. Born again or born from above both are true in that Greek word uh, anathen I think it is uh, can either mean born again or born from above, uh, and, and actually both are true. Uh, but I think the context, since Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? I, I think the, the meaning is born again, but it's also true that it is from above. Now, uh, Jesus said, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Okay, now born of water, I, I believe that's a reference to the word of God. Uh, elsewhere in scripture, the word of God is referred to like in Ephesians, the washing of water uh, by the word, he mentions. And listen to what Peter says. 1 Peter 1, 23, Peter says, being born again. Now note, he uses the exact term born again being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Okay, so notice, born again by the word of God. So, uh, and, and Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again. Begotten us again. That's another way of saying we've been born again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And, uh, you know, James, in James 1.18, says it this way, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. So he, he begat us, in other words, he gave us life through the word of truth, that we should be kind of first fruits of his creatures. Okay, now, uh, so, so being raised from spiritual death to spiritual life. Now, now we know that, that God does this through faith. By grace are you saved through faith, right? But this is looking at it from the point of view that when we put our faith in Christ, you know, this is what God does in us. And, and, and so to be raised from spiritual death to spiritual life, God gives us his eternal life. He makes us alive so that now we're a new person. We can rightly respond to him. He regenerates us. Uh, we are born again with a new birth from above. And you know the prophet Ezekiel describes the effects of the new covenant on those who are saved. He says, hey, you'll receive a new heart and a new spirit. Let me read to you Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, 
and a new spirit will I put within you. And of course, we know that's the Holy Spirit. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Okay, so uh, so here we find that, um, here's what I want you to notice. Justification describes how the legal guilt of our sin is resolved through God forgiving us through Christ's blood. And regeneration describes God's work within us, fitting us to be rightly related to God and for spending eternity with him. So God raised us from a state of spiritual death to a state of spiritual life, and he made us new. Um, now, you have the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, verse 2 says, Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Now, the, the Ephesian Christians were first generation Christians who lived godless lives before their conversion. Okay, so, so what do I mean by first generation Christians? Well, they were the first ones in their family to be saved. Okay, so, like, for example, I am not a first-generation Christian. And, uh, you know, perhaps many of you who may be listening to this or not. In other words, my parents were Christians. And, and on my uh, mother's side, I know my grandmother was a Christian. I, I don't know about my grandfather. He died before I was ever born. Uh, and I don't know, uh, you know, going farther back, uh, in in my family lineage, I wouldn't be surprised if they were. Uh, they probably were, but but on my father's side, I know that my dad was a Christian. My mom and dad, and then my grandparents were Christians, and my great grandfather and then uh, grandmother, they were certainly were Christians. And you know, I I don't know, but I, so I'm at least a, a third or fourth generation Christian. So I grew up in a Christian home. And there's some of you who maybe, and I, I've known people like this, they grew up in a Christian home, and they get saved at a very early age. So they never really lived, I mean, they were sinners, and they know this and they admit it, but they never lived a wicked, debauched, depraved, filthy life because they were saved at an early age and learned to live a godly life from the time they were young. You know what I have to say about that? That's wonderful. That's the ideal. And God didn't save you from uh, from what you had become, you know, filthy and polluted with sin. God say, If you were saved early in life, God saved you from what you may have become had he not saved you and had he not uh, changed your life and given you a, a new heart and made your life. So, so he says, you in time past... He says, you walked according to the course of this world. So their past life is described in terms really applicable to all unbelievers, but more so to those who weren't saved at an early age. Okay, and He says, they walked according to the course of this world. World here is the Greek word cosmos, and it refers to uh, the system or arrangement of things within the realm of human activity that is in opposition to God. Okay, worldly ungodly culture, the, the ungodly currents of, of what's going on in the world within the realm of what people do. Okay, that's the, the course of this world. This world is following a course or direction, and they were walking in lockstep in agreement with the ungodly world. They were conformed to the ungodliness of the world in which we live. Okay, they walked according to the course of this world. And uh, by the way, the Bible tells us as believers, be not conformed to this world. Don't let the ungodliness of the age in which we live shape you into its mold, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. That's Romans 12, 1 and 2 talks about that. All right, now, he says, you walked according to the prince of the power of the air. <clears throat> now, The prince of the power of the air, that's a reference 
to Satan. So they walk, walked according to Satan. Really, they were doing the will of Satan. They were living their lives in agreement uh, and in harmony with Satan and in opposition to God. Notice Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. Now, prince means ruler. And what, what does it mean, the power of the air? Okay, uh, the air uh, it surrounds the earth and it's everywhere. It permeates everything. And, and in the same sense, you, you can't see the air, but it's very real. And the spiritual realm is invisible like the air, but yet it's very real. And it permeates the entire earth and has a tremendous amount of influence. So Satan is the prince or the leader of the power of the air. And, and Satan is also called the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So Satan is at work in the ungodly. And here they're called children of disobedience because their lives are characterized by disobedience. Do you know, it is not true that we're all God's children. That's only true in a creational sense, physically. But there are the children of disobedience. That's unbelievers. And then there are the children of God or the people of God or the children of light. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew thirteen thirty-eight: The field is the world. This is in the parable of the tares and the wheat. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. So Jesus said, hey, there are the children of the kingdom, and then there are the children of the wicked one. That's a distinction, right? Luke 16, 8, And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. So Jesus mentioned the children of this world and the children of light. Okay, so you and I who are saved by grace through faith in Christ, we are the children of light. And then in distinction from us, the children of disobedience are also called the children of this world. Um, now, 1 John 3, 10 says, In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. So here in 1 John 3, 10, Hey, they're children of God, and they're children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Okay, so... so um, Satan is the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Why is there so much wickedness and sin and evil and corruption and lies uh, in, in the, and, and evil, corruption, uh, and destruction of things that are good in this world? Well, part of it is the sinfulness of the human heart. But make no mistake about it, there are, there are evil spiritual powers that are fanning the flames of human corruption and Satan and his forces, the powers of the air, uh, are ultimately behind it. Now he says in verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation, our lifestyle, in times past in the lusts of our flesh. Now the flesh here is, refers to the sinful aspects of our hu fallen human nature. He says we were fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Hey, we did what we wanted to do, what we felt like doing, what we thought about doing. We were living to please ourselves, right? He says, and we're by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Okay, so now here the children of disobedience are, are also called the children of wrath. Why? Because they're under God's wrath. And notice they were by nature the children of wrath. By nature the children of wrath. Do you know this problem of sin that all humans share? It begins in the womb. Psalm 51 5 says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So in other words, hey, when I was in my mother's womb, uh, from the moment I was conceived, there was sin. The seeds of sin were sown within my human fallen heart. Psalm 58, 3 says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray, astray as soon as they be born, speaking 
lies. There again, that inherent sinfulness of man. In Isaiah 48, 8, through the prophet Isaiah, God speaks to Israel and says, I knew that thou wouldest deal very treacherously and was called a transgressor from the womb. Okay, so Paul says here that they, we were, we, I used to be, you used to be, and if, if you're not saved, you still are, by nature, the children of wrath, even as others. That's why we need to be born again. We need God to raise us from a state of spiritual death and make us alive with the eternal life of God, to make us a new person who, because of God's changing within us, uh, we are able to rightly relate to God. And and uh, so, now I love, um, uh, let me just say one more thing. This inherent sinfulness that we're born with, we're not just innocent victims of it. We are willful participants in it. John 3.19 says, this is the condemnation. This is what condemns people who die without Christ. That light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Okay, now, I'm glad it doesn't stop there. Verse 5 says, but God, who is rich in mercy, God has a lot of mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. So, so see, here we were sinners, dead in our trespasses and sins, but God, who is rich in mercy, has a great love wherewith he loved us. And I'm so thankful that God didn't just say, man, you guys are wicked and corrupt. Forget about you. Uh, I'm going to give you what you deserve. But see, God didn't give us what we deserved. He showed us mercy and love and grace. It says, God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, he still loved us. He hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace, ye are saved. Okay, so he reminds us, hey, this salvation, it's by God's grace. We can't earn it. We can't merit it. We can't deserve it. We're saved by God's grace through faith. And so he raised us from the dead, quickened us together with Christ. You know, Romans 5, 8 says this, God commendeth or showed or demonstrated or proved, God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, I hope that there's been a definite specific point in your life where you've repented of your sins and put your faith in Christ and you received him as your Lord and Savior. You believe the gospel that he died for you and rose again from the dead and you trusted in him as your Lord and Savior. If so, uh, th these things that we've read about, our response should be, Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for showing your mercy and grace to me. If there, there's anyone who within the sound of my voice, you're hearing this or watching this and you're not saved, the door of God's mercy is open to you. Forget about trying to earn your way to heaven by being good. You can't do it. You've already blown it, just like I have. So uh, the, the idea is you come to God for mercy through Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. May the love of God and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit and the mercy and grace of Christ be with you now and forever. Amen.